I grew up uh, in, in the blues and didn't realize it. Uh, my, my father had a small business where he would uh, uh, have jukeboxes, pinball machines, pool tables, and that sort of thing, and he would service juke joints with them. And uh, we would take the new, the newest music uh, of, of the week out or the month out, and load it onto the the, uh, the jukeboxes. And uh, I really, really hated that job. <laughs> I, I hated it because I had to give up my weekends, my Saturdays and Sundays, to run the route, as my dad called it. Uh, and then it took my going away to Kentucky uh, to school. And uh, I was in, in college and. and um, was uh, one of my, my uh, classmates' dorm room, <clears throat> and there was this music playing. I said, man, I really like that music. Well, who is that He said, well, you ought to like it. That, that, that's, that's John Lee Hooker <laughs> from Clarksdale, Mississippi. And, uh, and then he launched into all this history about blues artists and the impact of blues music on American popular music, uh, and that it was really um, the basis for American popular music. And I never thought of it that way. It, it was that music that I had to listen to when I, we ran the route, and so I had a bad attitude about it. And it took someone from outside Mississippi to turn me on to the blues. For me, it was the British Invasion. You know, when I was in <laughs> high school, and, and the bands that were popular, the music that I listened to were primarily uh, British artists, Led Zeppelin, the Rolling Stones, you know, Eric Clapton, the Kinks, all of these people were playing American blues music. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but, but the music that, that we were dancing to and uh, listening to as, as kids were, was the mu our music being brought back to us from overseas. Well, you know, the, the first time, I just created it. Yeah, 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 and we had a few meetings. We had a few meetings. But we never really got it. It didn't go anywhere. But, uh, uh, then Governor Musgrove, for one year, established the Mississippi Blues Commission, uh, and uh, it was to, to put together a report, and uh, once the report was done, it was dissolved, and I said, you know, this, this music is so important that we really should not uh, let this commission go, okay. and so we wound up um, uh, forming a, a, a piece of legislation to to institutionalize it. You know, originally it was it was designed uh, to honor uh, what we call the birthplace of America's music, to honor the blues. Uh, and then as it uh, sort of matured and the journey continued, we were looking for ways to, to create visitor experiences. And then beyond that, we've gotten into uh, what we call the work of benevolence, where we literally raise money and work with uh, blues practitioners who have financial needs, health needs. And so, so we're both, uh, you know, we're about economic development, we're about tourism, we're about benevolence, and we're also about sort of telling this story and sort of claiming uh, this piece of American culture. Uh, and, and we do that through the building of these trails, through the erection of, of particular uh, markers and communities and, and each place that we go it's a partnership it's not just the state of Mississippi showing up with a historical marker and saying to a community we're here and here's your story uh, we, we, we have blue scholars and we, we work with the communities to raise matching monies and we have a full-on relationship uh, whether it's working with a museum or with private property owners or with communities uh, so that there's this huge investment and the great thing about the Blues Trail uh, is that it, it its purpose was to attract people but, but also to lead people to places. For example, the, the Blues Trail has led people to Indianola and we have built the B.B. King Museum. The Blues Trail has led people to Cleveland and we are building uh, the Grammy Museum. Uh, the Blues Trail leads people uh, to the Highway 61 Blues Museum in, in Leland, Mississippi, where we have three blues markers. So it leads people around to other attractions, uh, but it also builds civic pride, which is probably not something that we were really thinking well, about in the early know, days, but it's certainly been one of the... The one thing that I've been amazed by is, is how much communities embrace their, their, their Blues Trail marker. It's a, a real badge of, of honor and pride for them. Different communities uh, like um, 
the notoriety and, and getting uh, recognition for the artists who live there, who, who uh, perform there, and, and uh, who um, in many instances got their names there, made, made their bones, so to speak. And so um, uh, we have a lot of instances where, where communities come together to, to raise money, and a lot of these communities are really um, uh, struggling. Uh, they don't have a lot of resources laying around. Uh, but they, they, they piece their money together to, to find the matching monies to uh, establish a marker there and the community comes out. Uh, oftentimes we'll have local performers and certainly the local elected officials and, and citizens who are active in the community uh, come out to celebrate uh, the fact that they're getting a marker in their community. And the funding uh, is a fascinating uh, sort of uh, quilt of in the earliest days, uh, we wrote grants to the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities, and we got federal dollars to help us get started that would be matched by local and state dollars. We've gotten grants from the Mississippi Department of Transportation because they're our partner, and that's an unlikely partner. You think, well, what does, what does the Department of Transportation have to do with a cultural initiative? And, it, and, the, and the answer is everything because people have to travel on roads and we have to gain access uh, to, to right-of-ways and byways in order to erect these. And then sometimes when we erect a, on a, small, a, a marker on a small rural road, we have to think about where will the visitor park. Mm -hmm. or, you know, so there's a lot of issues that we've sort of dealt with in creating these partnerships. But we also raise money by selling car tags. You can buy a Mississippi Blues Trail car tag in Mississippi. And the funds go to the to the work of, of promoting uh, uh, the trail. Uh, we have a benevolence fund, as I mentioned before, where we do fundraisers uh, around that. We have a foundation, which is our fiscal agent. We, so we have a commission and a foundation. Uh, you know, and, and about the benevolence fund, we have a lot of our, our artists who still are struggling economically. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them fall on hard times, and maybe that's why they still play the, and sing the blues. But uh, we had something to, to occur a couple of years ago where uh, an anonymous donor uh, donated $100,000 towards our benevolence fund, and it's been able to, to really stretch our resources. We have uh, awarded over $17,000 in grants to blues musicians. We've had cases in which one musician uh, actually has, he lost his home. His house burned down, he lost his, 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 his instruments, and we gave him a grant. Uh, just recently, we awarded a grant to an individual who really needed some money to, to meet his day-to-day -day obligations, as well as to buy his medicines. You see, most of these guys and gals don't have any type of medical insurance and even some of them, we had a case in which one individual really didn't know how to apply to Medicaid. So we're trying to assist not only in terms of actual funding, but with some type of advice to help them uh, make it in life because uh, these folk have really not gotten what they deserve in terms of the monies from the blues and we are trying to address some of their needs. You, you, you've got it right. This is a passion for me. It's, it's, it is a passion because I didn't discover the blues yesterday. I grew up with the blues. I grew up in the Mississippi Delta, which is considered the home of the blues. And it's interesting. Blues folk, even though they were kind of rough and rowdy at the juke joint, they saw what my grandmother was trying to do in terms of keep me on the straight and narrow. And they would do all they could to assist her. They did not try to engage me in all that kind of stuff, but they tried to keep me going straight, and I appreciate that. And I feel as if I'm paying a debt to those individuals who helped me achieve whatever I've achieved, wherever I, wherever I am now, I owe a lot to a lot of people. I retired from the University of Massachusetts, where I was uh, academic vice president. Prior to that, I was professor of biochemistry and molecular biology at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, and I was provost of the medical center. So I've been in administration and in research. I did my research in cancer research, 
uh, 17 years of cancer research, five years of sickle cell anemia, and also spent a year as interim president of Trigaloo College, my alma mater. Well, when I was at the Arts Commission, uh, we decided we would take a scientific look at the creative economy in Mississippi. We knew, we all knew that Mississippi had birthed these amazing artists, blues artists, literary, uh, you know, architects, designers, poets. We did a study and we were astounded to find that over 60,000 people in Mississippi work in the creative sector of our economy. Uh, and that about three and a half percent of Mississippi's uh, economy was in this creative sector. And that really surprised a lot of people. Honestly, I thought it might even be as much as five percent, but it was a great place to start a conversation about not only these creative types that, that represent Mississippi, but back in the state where creativity intersected uh, with manufacturing and where creativity intersected with industry and where Creativity intersects with community development and tourism, and, and it's about looking at the sum total of, of, of the economic impact on cultural uh, and creative enterprises, creative individuals, and creative communities, and then trying to think about, you know, how do you grow this, and can you grow, can government impact uh, a sector of its economy that is so unusual and unique as the creative sector. So we've begun that journey uh, and, and we've begun to talk about it as a strategy, an economic development strategy, not just in tourism, uh, but again, you take the Viking Range Corporation, which basically was a manu stove manufacturing, but the long tail of Viking was that they reinvigorated, uh, they redeveloped Greenwood through their successes by investing in cooking schools and spas and hotels and restaurants and live music venues. Uh, and so, so you saw this, we got to witness in a very short time here, in just a number of years, about the length of time that the Blues Trail has been developed. In about a decade, we've seen like PV Electronics literally not only be a, a global success, but its impact back in Meridian which is where they're headquartered. So we've seen these creative economies really have huge impacts on uh, redefining and redeveloping communities. And, and we've seen the Blues Trail become a part, of, an important part of the sort of creative assets of communities where, where people see them as an attractor, uh, both for visitors, for building civic pride, and also just for sort of rounding out the quality of life in yeah, and you know, uh, we have done all that really uh, without incentivizing. Uh, the the um, uh, the growth of it had been organic. The state hadn't really really focused on it. But what we started to do was look at okay, well, how can we incentivize it? So we're we're doing a better job, a much better job of, of providing those kinds of incentives that I call non-traditional economic development incentives. As most of our incentives are, are focused on manufacturing and industrial development, but if we were to, to apply the same kind of energy towards incentivizing the creative economy, uh, we can have a much better rounded economy here in Mississippi. Uh, a good example of, of, a, of a community that has done that uh, is Ocean Springs. Uh, they, they've built uh, their community around the, the, the visual arts and, and, and crafts um, uh, community there. Uh, another one is, is Clarksdale. Uh, Clarksdale is, is really be becoming a mecca for the blues. And I really think that in five years, Clarksdale is, is going to be like a, a Soho of the South because so many artists are moving there. They're building loft apartments in the, and, and downtown now. That yeah, you would, abandoned communities. You know, and, and right. And these, a lot of the buildings have previously been abandoned and, and we're, we're, we're sitting uh, lying fallow. But, uh, Clarksdale's blood buzzing now, and it's because of the blues. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we've got to do in Mississippi is is have that that live music experience every day of the week somewhere in, in the state, so that when visitors come, they're expecting live music. And uh, you know, if it's Wednesday, well, we don't do much 
live music on Wednesday, you need to come back on Friday. <laughs> well, that's not what, what's going to, going to be attractive to the, the visitor. We've got to have it ready for them when they, whenever they show up. But live music in Mississippi is no different than live music in New York and Los Angeles. It primarily happens on the weekends. Okay. And that's a problem that Senator Horn's talking about. We've got to figure out a way to incentivize live music on Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. Ireland went through this. When, when Ireland was going through their renaissance and they were selling Ireland as an experience, the one thing that a visitor to Ireland absolutely wanted to see was live music in a pub. Mm -hmm. So the government got involved and began to incentivize the hiring of local musicians so that visitors would have the experience that they traveled across the ocean for, uh, around the globe for. And we've got to figure that one out. We've got to figure out a way where if you go to the trouble and expense to come to Mississippi and you've never been here before and you're, you're interested in our culture, whether it's literary, civil war, civil rights, architecture, food, the arts, music, regardless, we've got to show, we've got to be able to demonstrate an authentic, real experience for you so that you aren't disappointed. Right. Uh, so, so we're working on that, but, but again, it's, it, we are a work in progress. Uh, there was a time when there were more live music venues than there are now, but through this effort, through the sort of promoting of the creative economy, through the work in live entertainment and the blues trail, we're beginning to, 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 to reap some, some dividends from this investment. And who would have ever thought that this thing called the blues, which nobody wanted and everybody ran from, uh, would become the thing that we could hang our hat on become the thing that we could begin to change our image around, to, to invite people to come and experience. Uh, but it is sort of uh, one of those uh, ironies uh, of our culture. It is a, it's, it's really interesting that this thing that, that was so awful and, and was so sort of dreaded has become our calling card.